Oh, I'm sorry, I was muted. I was just explaining that. <laughs> My bad. I was just explaining. Welcome, Lucas. And uh, we're going to be starting in a second. Uh, Lucas, so uh, yesterday, Kai and I, we were talking about you. So Kai is here with us as well. Just, just saw that. Um, and we were talking about your case. And uh, uh, the way we go is we have every Friday this, this, this conference and uh, we have been invited uh, some you know, guests as well from around the globe to join as well with the case that uh, has the goal of education and to discuss some you know, technical nuances and case indication for uh, a different, uh, different types of pathology around the brain and the spine. So thanks for, for joining us today. Uh, so now it's already 7.01 uh, on respect of time of everybody that is here. Uh, I believe we can uh, start and go ahead. Dr. Quinones, I know, has a, a NIH meeting, so not sure if he's going to be able to join us today, but we can certainly go ahead. So everyone, it's an it's, uh, it's honor for me to introduce Dr. Lucas Alberni Albuquerque. Lucas is, is, first of all, he's a very, very good friend of mine. He is, he is you know, he's my brother. Long story short, he is somebody I know uh, since uh, 2000, I don't know, I think maybe before the 2000s. So we we're high school friends and uh, we, you know, went through the trail of neurosurgery uh, together. He was a, a big uh, source of inspiration for me to continue the pursuit of neurosurgery, uh, a good support and a friend. And uh, after his, uh, you know, the training in uh, the Santa Casa de Belo Horizonte in Minas Gerais with Professor Atos de Souza, world well-known vascular surgeon that left us a few years ago, unfortunately. He went back home to our hometown of Fortaleza in Northeast Ceará. And uh, he, from ground zero, he started a program in, uh, you know, in awake craniotomy for low-grade gliomas. And it is, in my opinion, incredible what he has developed so far. Uh, he has uh, followed the steps of uh, uh, Dr. Hughes Dufault, with whom he trained in France. Uh, at the same time that uh, Kai Sorn Chai Chana, Dr. Chai Chana was there as well, so they know each other as well. And uh, he has been applying that uh, technique, uh, in my opinion, with a, a lot of success. And now he has the numbers to you know, start presenting his results in a, let's say, in a not so wealthy resource uh, setting. So uh, without further ado, I'm gonna you know, uh, share uh, this with Lucas and Lucas, please uh, go ahead and uh, we're looking forward to hearing to learning from you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, everybody. It's a, it's a really pleasure, pleasure to be here. Uh, there was very kind words from GP. We are really good friends. Uh, I believe since 2000 or a little before. <laughs> um, uh, I will share my screen now, yeah? Yes, you should be able, you're a co-host, sir. Have you seen my screen? Yep. Okay. Um, so again, it's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm, I'm from Fortaleza. Uh, GP asked me to, to give some geographic lessons before the, 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 I show the case. <laughs> uh, I'm here from Fortaleza. It's the, it's an, it's the, it is in the Northeast region of Brazil. Uh, we are the six a city in Brazil, and our metropolitan region is around one, uh, four, four million inhabitants. I, before I show the case, I would like to acknowledge my team. Uh, we have, uh, they are essential for my work. In this case, we, I had a lot of help from my, my speed therapist, Fashma, the neuropsychologist, Jairli, uh, the, our anesthesiologist, uh, Felipe Borges, and the radiologist, Daniel Tavra, and Professor Estelio is the neurosurgeon that helped me a lot in my career and was very, a, a lot of support uh, in my project. So just uh, let's start. Um, I will present a case of a 37-year-old female, the Brazilian, right-handed, 
three years of study, speaks only Portuguese and works with commerce. Uh, her chief complaint was seizure. Um, her first seizure was in December 2021. And from December until April 2022, uh, this, uh, her seizure was only transient aphasia with, uh, without consciousness change. In April 2022, uh, she started uh, presenting also some motor uh, symptoms in, in the seizure with right facial and right arm contraction and no, no consciousness change. Um, her seizure frequency was around once a week and she was medicated with phenytoin uh, 100 uh, free and daily. Uh, her past medical history was positive for mood disorder. Uh, she had a suicide attempt at 27 years old. Uh, no other comorbidities. Uh, just not, do, do not smoke, do not uh, consume alcohol and anything else. Her physical examination was unremarkable. Uh, she had a, a good a body mass index. And the neurological examination, the general neurological examination, we wasn't able to see any, any uh, uh, it, it was unremarkable. The mental status was normal. Uh, they sp speak very well, uh, no cranial nerve disturb. Uh, motor and sensory function was normal and reflex were normal. Um, here are the, the pre-op images. Here we may see a uh, uh, huge insular glioma. Uh, here's the, the flare image. It, it, uh, the biggest diameter was around six centimeters and the segmented volume was around 81 cc. <clears throat> and comparing the flare image with the T2, we may see a clear mismatch uh, comparing the T1 pre and post uh, uh, contrast, there was no enhancement. The SWE uh, showed no, no neovascularization, no calcification, and no blood. Um, and the diffusion, there was no restricted diffusion here. And here, the, the, the others uh, cuts. Uh, in the coronal view, we may see that there is an frontal operational involvement, and here there is also a uh, a temporary stand involvement with maybe, maybe a little involvement of the superior temporal gyrus beginning right here. Um, in the sagittal view, we may see that there is involvement uh, of the so-called Broca's area, the past operacularis and past triangularis also. Uh, Lucas, if you don't mind, um, I do see that we have some of our radiology team uh, in the line as well. And I just would like to invite, I think I saw Dr. Gupta here. And uh, I believe we probably have uh, additional um, members as well. I mean, uh, um, if they want to, to have some, some advice, some, some talk, uh, it would be a pleasure. No, I think, I think it, it's, I think uh, our guest speaker has given a wonderful description, anatomic, and I think he has also highlighted the key uh, morphological features in terms of signal characteristics. And I think I think it's been very elegantly described. I think you you are absolutely in the money. I really have not much to add. Uh, I I think personally that it is probably in the partial percolaris for the large part. I think the triangularis probably displaced anteriorly, but that is based on just the sample images that have been presented here. I'm sure I don't uh, I don't question uh, the judgment. So I I think it's it is exactly as described. And I think he will describe a little bit more. Please, uh, please go ahead. Thank you very much for your comments. Lucas, if I may ask you just for the sense of uh, our understanding, like uh, I see kind of like some nice anatomical details in these three pictures that you have selected there. W would you mind sharing with us when you were looking at those images and you just described the, you know, extension through the temporal stand and and uh, the relationship with the, you know, the basal nuclei and so on and so forth. Can you mm -hmm. share with us, for example, in the coronal here, uh, how you read, because to my eyes, this looks like a, really like a, a true insular uh, originated tumor. 
Uh, how can you just share with us how you look at the boundaries, like in the medial aspect, in the spiral aspect, lateral aspect, and okay. imperial aspect to decide your approach as well? Because I know you you look at those as well. Okay. Can you can you see my mouse here? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, here, um, there is a lot of uh, in the corner of view. It's 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 very very eloquent to, to see a lot of things here. Here we may see the talons, and here the internal capsule. Um, it, it's really important in this case. This this is, this was not a randomic cut, right? This is a very important cut because here we may see the the, the carotid artery and the carotid bifurcation here, the A1 and oh the A1 and M1. And it's we know that in the medial portion of the M1 and the the A1, there are the the perforating arteries that are uh, very important landmarks in planning uh, for low grade gliomas, for insular gliomas. And we know that there, when there is involvement uh, medial to the this the the the, the most proximal part of M1. There are serious uh, uh, limitations because of vascular, vascular. Uh, it's, a, it's a vascular danger zone, right? So here, uh, about the temporary stand, I, I see here the, the, the this, this involvement starting to go to the temporal lobe here, and here in the, this most cortical portion of the, the temporal superior temporal gyrus, maybe maybe uh, also a radian uh, infiltration. Um, uh, as a matter of fact, we know that um, we may see in the, the MRI view only a fraction of the, the lesion, um, maybe around one uh, 5,000 uh, cells uh, per millimeter cubic uh, that, that we may see in the flare lesion. So we know that the, 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 the pathology is much more extensive than we really see here, right? I really like what you mentioned about the vessels because it's it's a you know a very important uh, surgical anatomical detail to be considering those tumors because you know A1 medial lenticular striate M1 lateral lenticular striates and that relationship because if the tumor extends medial to that portion there is potentially some extension into as you said the internal capsule and that, that's where the perforators will go to to supply that region because the insulin is not supplied by those lenticular striates. It's lateral to those lenticular striates. And uh, I fully agree with your point that helps to, to kind of like to map that. And I know you're going to show the functional way to resect those tumors. But when we're doing it in a microsurgical way to resect those tumors, the relationship with those vessels is what defines uh, or medial extension of the resection. I think I'd just like to add one quick comment. Uh, most classic insular gliomas, of course, things are not always classic, but classic insular gliomas, they they usually immediately stop at the external capsule. And, and even though it seems like that the basal nuclei or ganglia are, are sort of, are, are not visualized well, they're usually pushed away. Uh, so that's why these gliomas tend to have a very short border medially, classically. Uh, so that may be the case. I think this is probably stopping at the external capsule. And I think the, the chamber is pushed medially and the internal capsule is perhaps even further medial uh, so you can kind of see in coronal two stripes, uh, two gray matter stripes. One laterally is uh, is is the is the is the mm. from, yeah that is probably the tendon, and you see uh, the the globus pallidus more medially, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, and so so it's probably it's very likely that the uh, the, uh, the capsule. Of course, we, we need to see exactly where this section is taken. Uh, classically speaking, that's what the classic teaching is that the insular gliomas tend to spare uh, the basal nuclei. And that's, that's absolutely true. That's like one of the, exactly one of the concepts that we use for microsurgical resection. And then in microsurgery, we cannot see the differentiation of the white matter as we go deep there, but we can see the direction of the vessels. Uh, but uh, to use the direction of the vessels, uh, it's it's quite tricky and that's why i, I really believe in the you know in, in the techniques of monitoring for those as well but anyways let me stop <laughs> interrupting lucas and lucas please go ahead because no. then you have thank more important thank you thank you very much for the comment they are always welcome yeah so... and, and one last one last just a little additional information just for everybody's uh i think now at uh now at seven tesla we have the ability to elegantly see the perforators 
I mean, you can see perforators all the way out uh, to the caudate as they are traversing these structures. And uh, if that relationship is important surgically, then one might consider, I don't know, no, nobody has ever published any data on it, but we are seeing the directions of the perforator now very elegantly. And if that is of surgical importance, we can certainly uh, attempt a case or two and see how that plays out. There, there is a there is a, a colleague here in Brazil, uh, Gustavo Isolan, the published uh, this year uh, study just about this about the, the, the perforating artery here and a way to, to a better way to, to differentiate and to guide in surgery. It's it's a nice paper. So just uh, uh, for a classification matter. Uh, this is uh, in Yasagio's classification. This is a uh, insular glioma type 3B because of the opercular involvement. And uh, using the Burgess and I zone classification, the uh, uh, that pass uh, two lines in the, the serum fusion and another in the, the form of Monroe. Uh, there is involvement of all the four zones, but the main involvement at zone one and zone two. This is important for surgical planning. So our differential diagnosis was mainly a diffuse low grade lioma, uh, but we know that we cannot uh, a, a, a ignore the, the possibility of high grade lioma. The absence of uh, contrast enhancement uh, does not exclude it. So it's always a, a, a differential diagnosis. Because of the mismatch, uh, we also may uh, uh, go beyond our differential diagnosis and maybe uh, believe, probably believe that it's an EDH mutant lesion with uh, 1P9Q intact. Um, we know that in this paper shows a very impressive, pretty positive value, value for the mismatch for uh, EDH, EDH mutation. So the management options, when we see a case like this, we may, may think about observation, biopsy, or surgery. There's the, the options we may discuss here. Um, in my particular opinion, observation- Lucas, can I, can I, before you share your, your opinion strategy, can I just stop you for a quick moment? And I'm gonna sure. bother, <laughs> I'm gonna bother somebody uh, now. I mean, uh, let me see, Ish, are you here? Can you hear me? Hi, Ench. Good morning. Hey, uh, Lucas. This is Ench Goyal. He is, uh, you know, a fantastic resident here. He is a, a 104 PGY choose, and uh, a very good friend of mine as well. Uh, so, Ench, you you saw the case. You saw, you know, the description and the images. And so, um, you know, briefly, uh, what do you think, and what would be your next steps now that you have, you know, all those details about this case? Um, so I may have missed the first part, but my understanding is the patient was presenting with aphasia and seizures, right? Yes, yeah, seizures mostly, but uh, no, you know, no permanent neurological deficit, but for seizures, yeah. The, 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 the okay. neurologic examination was remarkable, the, the general neurologic examination. Sure. So uh, this likely will, uh, this is a tumor, um, I think it was non-contrast enhancing, if, I'm, if I remember. Yes. Correctly, I, I don't miss, okay. It's likely to be a low-grade glioma and with a T2 player mismatch, IDH mutant, uh, should likely get surgical resection now that low-grade gliomas um, are more favored to be treated and he is symptomatic um, given that it's left insular would be likely a left away craniotomy uh, with a motor and speech mapping. Before surgery, probably also would prefer to get a DTI imaging just to look at the white matter tracts more closely. I know there was discussion of uh, that, uh, that there's been pushing the external capsule medially, but just to look at more in close relation to the other white matter tracts would be good. And then also neuropsychological assessment, given that it's uh, likely to be an awake surgery. Good, very good. Lucas, uh, share with us what were your next steps. I'm sorry that I interrupted you. No, no, thank you. Uh, so, in, in my particular opinion, our observation is not a, is not a, a real option here. We know that these lesions are not stable. 
uh, they are growing and they, they will able to, to transform in malignant tumor. Biopsy, uh, I don't I don't really understand an option for biopsy here. Uh, maybe in some case that we, we believe that we will not uh, remove a substantial, a significant uh, amount of tumor or in very deep lesions, but not in this case. And in, in my point of view, surgery is, is really the option here. Um, thinking about uh, noacraniotomy, we underwent a uh, speed therapist examination and the patient already presented some nomination deficit. The DO80 is a nomination test, really, really similar to the Boston nomination test. Um, no semantic, uh, just uh, alteration. Uh, the automatic language was normal. There was already a, a oral and reading comprehension deficit. And there was also a verbal fluence, a phonological verbal fluence deficit. And on the neuropsychological examination, we, we saw a poor function for IQ, uh, immediate memory, and recognition memory, and already left she in divided attention, executive function, long-term memory, and perception and visual construction abilities. So uh, the assessment and plan, uh, the patient was not was not well, although she looked well uh, with a good neurological examination, the, 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 cognitive, the cognitive assessment was not normal. Uh, she presented a worsening in the, the seizure pattern. And the, we know that there is no stable diffuse low-grade low glioma and the malignant transformation occurs in 50% in five years. So we plan a maximum safe resection in an awake craniotomy. The test selection, we use uh, the dual task in all the mapping. Dual task, uh, usually the a motor function with a an, an, uh, verbal uh, language task. Uh, the dual test, uh, doing two tasks at the same time is important to preserve uh, executive function, uh, memory work. Uh, at the beginning, you use counting for calibrate the, 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 the parameters for mapping and to find the ventral premotor cortex uh, boundaries. And the dual test was, was always with more uh, motor function counting or motor function with DO80 or the PPTT. The DO80 is like this uh, nomination test, as I said before, uh, where we show a black and white image and a little sentence, the patient to say, this is a duck. And the PPTT is this uh, pyramid palm tree test, is an uh, association test, a semantic test. The patient must uh, select at the bottom the best image to fit with the first image here. Uh, potential risks and complications, uh, as JP highlighted before, uh, the anatomic considerations are really important in this case. Uh, at the cortical point of view, uh, we need to, to highlight the importance of the, the frontal and temporal opercular here. The frontal opercular with the pars opercularis and the pars triangularis. Um, we know that the, the, the superior limiting sucus is, has a high co correspondence with the inferior frontal sucus. We know that the inferior limiting sucus of the insula has a, a high uh, correspondence with the superior temporal sucus. And we know that the, this anterior branch of the cerebral fissure, here's the cerebral fissure, the anterior branch, the superior branch, and the anterior branch has a high uh, correspondence of the anterior limits in sucus. So probably the, the, the insula is right here. And here's an image of the insula to, to show you. Uh, so at the, the cortical point of view, we, we may be, be prepared to, to work with the primary motor area, the ventral premotor cortex, that is the most ventral part of the, the precentral gyrus and the so-called Broca's area. At the subcortical uh, point of view, we need to, to know that at the, the opercular frontal part of uh, the, the, part, the frontal opercular, there is a super, uh, superior longitudinal fascicles, the part three, and the inferior frontal, uh, frontal occipital fascicles here, the, is to us uh, doing this surgery in, in, in a functional way, awake surgery, 
it's really important because it's very eloquent and it works as a shield to protect us from the perforating arteries. And the vascular uh, uh, structures uh, in the insula, there are all the, the M2 branches, M3 branches, M4 branches. The, there is the Sylvian vein at the, the, the beginning of the, the section. And the, as we said before, the lateral perforating arteries. So we, we, the compl potential complications are language deficit, motor deficit, and stroke from small perforating, the, from middle cerebral artery branches or venous infection, infarction. We underwent a surgery in- Lucas, can I ask you one thing before you go specific to the surgery? I, I like how you divided kind of like the, you know, the potential risks and areas of complication, how you divide, like, uh, I, I suspect that the answer is yes, but when you uh, kind of like uh, have those different, you know, like low grade gliomas in different locations, I suspect therefore that you kind of try to put that specific lesion in sort of like of a map and, and to have those uh, different, you know, uh, fascicles around in the vascular vessels as well. So maybe that's something that can be interesting is kind of like, uh, in, and I learned that with Evandro for AVMs that every single thing in the brain has always a specific pattern of correlation, but okay. I suspect that for gliomas would be kind of like the same thing, especially for the deep seated ones. Maybe at some point we can think about like a map as a guidance for the resection of those. Uh, anyways, just an idea for a potential project that we can collaborate in the future. Yeah, uh, it, it would be great. It, it's, a, it's a great idea, great comment. Please go ahead. I'm sorry, I just wanted to share this, this you know, inside. <laughs> no, thank you. Um, the, the surgical approach, we prepare a left frontal temporal craniotomy uh, with awake language and model mapping. Uh, the anatomic corridor to us was left frontal and temporal transopercular. And the goal was a maximum safe resection. Uh, I use a lateral position. To me, it's easier to, 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 to do the test and I, I'm user to it. Uh, surgical equipment, we use the brain stimulator and the ultrasonic aspirator. Uh, brain mapping with our speed therapist in this case. And the anesthesia protocol was a sleep, awake, and sedation. Uh, I sleep for the, the, the skin and the, the school. And after awake the patient, after resecting the tumor, only a mute sedation to, 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 to finalize. Um, we don't know, we, we did not use DTI, no neural navigation, uh, and no somat sensory vocal potential here. Uh, we do not have functional MRI, uh, in preparative MRI, and ECOG. Um, from all these tools, uh, maybe I would like to, to, I would consider if I had used the ECOG. Uh, I believe it's, it's to me, it's important to confirm the absence of after discharge. But uh, there is a lot of support in literature to, to, to do it without it. And as a matter of fact, I, I, I had uh, some cases, a lot of cases without it, and I'm going to use it to, to do the surgery without the call. So as a frontal temporal incision, a uh, frontal temporal craniotomy. Here is the first first uh, image of the, the, the brain just before the just after the cortical mapping. Uh, just to situate here, we use a bipolar electrode uh, with uh, five millimeter spaced tips, bifasic current. Uh, the pulse frequ frequency was 60 hertz. Uh, the single pulse phase duration of one millisecond and the amplitude was 1.5 million pairs. Um, just for anatomic uh, situation, here's anterior, here's posterior, superior. Here is, is the, the ceiling fissure, the central sulcus, parietal lobe, frontal lobe, temporal lobe, uh, 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 post central gyrus, press central gyrus, pass opercularis, pass triangularis, pass orbitalis, and the superior temporal gyrus. Uh, as I, I said before, we may we may uh, uh, project the insula here based in, in, in the correspondence of the inferior limiting sulcus with the superior temporal sulcus, the superior limiting sulcus with the inferior frontal frontal sulcus, and the 
this anterior branch of the, the, the cerium fissure with the anterior limiting circles. So the two A, well, we found a speech arrest uh, and the MR and AP, we found speech arrest and negative motor response in the right arm. So it's a total negative motor area. So just from here to here was the, the ventral premotor cortex. The two aim was uh, inferior right facial contraction. In R2, we found one semantic perfusion and two anomias, and in the 40, uh, anomia. So we found a completely neuroplasticity at the Broca's area. We, after this initial brain mapping, we underwent a left frontal and temporal transopathical approach with continuous monitoring during tumor resection. And we found any a change in the test we stop at the resection and do a subcortical mapping. At the end, uh, we found just uh, we, we started to, to do a, 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 a cortical resection here, and just at the beginning, we found the anomia. Here in the, the four at the bottom, we found the anomia also. And here in the zero, we found a perseveration probably related to the caudate head. So we believe that here is the SLF3 and here is I4. Uh, it was an uneventful procedure, no, no pain complaint, no seizure. Uh, the pathology was a diffuse low-grade lymoma, a stosoma grade two. The immunostochemistry, uh, surprisingly, there was a EDH wild type, but we believe that was uh, is because we only have access to this mutation in our immunostochemistry. I HC 132, the P53 was positive, HERX negative, and the KI 67, 5%. So our diagnosis was a diffuse low grade lyoma, stressone grade two, and I do believe it's a false negative EDH. This, these are the post-operative image. Uh, we, we found uh, there was a negative, 4% of resection. There was a little residual tumor here in the most superior and posterior part. Um, we estimated a residual volume of 4. Point, um, almost 5 cc. There was no, no real bleeding. Uh, there was uh, no, no ischemia, no stroke here. That was really things, things that all well. Uh, there's, there are the other cuts, maybe uh, residual lesion here in the superior part portion, as I said. The, for the perceive day one, there was no fever, normal labs. The neurological examination was baseline, except by a reduction uh, of spontaneous speech. And the patient was discharged from intensive care unit. In the post-operative day two, we removed all devices and we discharged the home and day three. Though we did not, we, we, we do believe that is a false negative VGA, so no radiotherapy, no chemotherapy. And here's, it's really interesting to me, uh, the follow-up of the speech therapist examination. We may see an improvement at the nomination test, uh, improvement in the oral comprehension also improvement in the writing comprehension and the semantic verbal fluence a little bit of, was a little worse worse and no change at the, uh, the phonological verbal fluence and at the neuropsychological examination we may see also an improvement in the iq um, improvement in the learning function and improving recognition memory and the perception and visual construction abilities so it's it's really important. Uh, we, we see the most in this low grade glioma lesions uh, many times. The neurological examination are normal. So we need to use another tools, uh, cognitive assessment to to evaluate the how this, these patients are going. We are now at six months of follow up. The patient presented two seizures because of irregular use of the antiplatelet drug because of her. Uh, uh, mood disorder, and she returned to work 40 days after surgery. Thank you very much. Any question? 
Well, Lucas, uh, congratulations for, you know, uh, very, very nice case and very nice presentation. And uh, I do think that we have, uh, I mean, I do see a lot of fantastic people in the audience here. I see Dr. Gabriel Vargas. I see Dr. Fernando Hakin. I see Dr. Yuri Nevili from Brazil as well. Good friend of us. Uh, we have uh, here with us that joined us as well. Uh, uh, you know, Dr. Dan Sapsevitz, of course, Dr. Kai Chaichana, and uh, Dr. Quinones is getting in and out. But uh, if I may, let's start with Kai, who is somebody that is good friends of both of us as well. Kai. Hey, Lucas. Thank you. Hey, Lucas. Nice seeing you again. Hello, Kai. So long. So one of the things that shocked me, or not shocked, but amazed me about when we were spending time in Montpellier um, was the was the lack of use of extra equipment that we especially use here in the United States. Do you still, do you follow what uh, Dr. Defoe does? Like no navigation, no microscope? Yes, exactly the same thing. Here, I, I uh, GPS asked me to, to present a video. So, but video is really difficult without the microscope. So, so I'm sorry about the video, uh, but because I really do not use microscope, it's it's hard to record, uh, and it, it, it's it's very similar to to the the principles in the philosophy of Professor De Um No microscope, no no narrow navigation, only anatomy. Uh, uh, DP may understand my my philosophy about uh, uh, landmarks, craniotomy. He was he is a, a pupil of Professor Evandro, and. It's very strong in neuroanatomy, and it, he may say more about it. And it, it, it's it, okay. We, we uh, sometimes it's not an option. Sometimes it really, really, really don't have the tools that we like to have, but we need to adapt our reality to to the best we can offer for our patients. That was good. Congratulations. Great case. Great program. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kate. Very nice, Lucas. Yeah, I fully agree with, with Kai, and, and thanks for clarifying. Uh, I see here, I'm going to follow with a Brazilian friend of mine as well, Yuri. Uh, I see you there. Thank you so much for joining. Everyone, I'd like to introduce Yuri Nevili. He is a good friend of Lucas and I. In fact, Yuri, Lucas, and I, when we were med students, we were applying to residency together. We used to ride the subways together <laughs> to go <laughs> to interviews. So, uh, and Yuri right now, it's also somebody who I'm very uh, honored to have as a friend. He is the director of surgical neuro-oncology at the Institute, Institute of Cancer at the University of Sao Paulo, and is also doing a fantastic work in neuro-oncology in Brazil. And uh, hopefully he's going to be one of the, or future guests in the near future. Yuri, please share with us some of your impressions, please. Hello, everybody. Uh, uh... First of all, uh, thank you for the, your comments, and that's true. <clears throat> we applied for the neurosurgery residency uh, just at the same year, and it's a great pleasure to be with you. Uh, Lucas, a wonderful case, great, great description. I'm very impressed with the, with the results uh, that you, you were able to, to offer to this patient. Actually, uh, there was a very, very large uh, insular tumor. Uh, we know that insular tumor is one of the most challenging tumors that uh, the neurosurgeons have to deal in the practice. You, you've got to be able to, to understand very well all the details in the MRI, in the preoperative uh, scan. And we, we have a, such a great discussion over here, paying attention to the landmarks and, uh, and this is very important because you've got to be able to, to know where the, the, especially the perforating arteries, which is a, a, a very uh, uh, dangerous region if you don't have a look at it. Uh, and also uh, you have to, to have the ability to perform the brain mapping, not only the cortical mapping, but also the subcortical mapping which is very, very difficult to perform actually when they're dealing with such a, <clears throat> with such a, 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 a very large tumor, just like the one that Lucas uh, presented to us. 
Uh, <clears throat> Lucas, uh, I'd like to ask you something. Uh, uh, the perforating arteries are, is something that we are all, uh, always paying attention very well because uh, we know that if we, if we, it's a, it's, I mean, uh, if we uh, coagulate those arteries, you know that we have, uh, we're in trouble. Uh, but there is a way to, to perform uh, the mapping uh, and to know before you achieve that region um, I know I, I don't know if you were able to perform this mapping of the eye fault, and if in the surgery did you actually see any of those arteries or no? Uh, hello, Yuri. Thank you very much for your comments. It's it's a it's a really pleasure to see you here. Um, uh, at the at the left side, um, yeah, uh, just uh, some thoughts. Uh, I believe that surgery, in, insular surgery in, in the left side are easy, is th these surgeries are easier than at the right side. Um, at the left side, the IFOC works as a real shield to us. So uh, 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 as the patient is always doing the test, it's always speaking, always doing semantic associations, naming associations, um, if the patient has any disturb, we just stop and and map every, everything. So as a matter of fact, we it, it's quite of safe to do at the left side because I really don't see the, the, the perforating arteries. Uh, it's different in the right side. Uh, sometimes you may see the IFO function at the right side. Professor Dufour says that. It's, it's really easy to say that the eye fall at the right side, but to me, it's, it's not so, so regular. I have some difficulties in some cases, the semantic association, the right side is not so, so, so sharp as the left side. Mm -hmm. So it's, I, I have a lot of more, more uh, uh, concerns about the right side and the perforating artists. My, my complications in insular surgery was almost always at the right side. I, I don't know if I answer all you, you asked me, but uh, these are my thoughts about the perforating in left side insular glioma. Yeah, that, that, that's, that's, that's it. I, I fully agree with you. Actually, uh, for me, it, it is very, very difficult to, to, to map the IFO of the right side. And, and that's one of the main concerns about this surgery when you're, especially when you're dealing with such large insular tumors. And there is another issue that you have to pay attention is the uh, corticospinal tract with, you, you may find it in the, the deep-seated uh, location posteriorly. And it, if you don't pay attention, you may, you may uh, have problems with that as well. I don't know if you, in, in this case, because it, it, is, it was a, a very large tumor, and the posterior uh, co uh, component uh, were very close to the cortical spinal tract. Uh, did you, did you, were, were you able to, to map the, the cortical spinal tract as well? Uh, uh, at the deep part, no, no, no more of, no more response. Um, the I, I thought is really a shield to us <laughs> in this case. Okay. That's it, that were my comments. I, I really appreciate the, uh, the opportunity to be with you guys here. Uh, great pleasure for me. Thank you. Thank you, Yuri. And JP, um, there's a question there for Lucas. It's, this was from Dan Simelowicz. Yeah. You know, Dan, did you want to, I don't know if you guys uh, explore that question. It's actually a very relevant question. You know, I don't know if you want to take it. Uh, Dan, if you're there, you can ask directly to Luca and, uh, and just go from there. I did. Hey GP, how are you doing? And I can't share my screen right now, but I had a case this week with my chief here in the residence. We had a patient, a young patient, 35 years old, and he presents with uh, focal seizures. Dan, hold on one second. Uh, Andres um, or uh, Andrea or yeah, he, Diego, can you guys can share. give Dan the ability I, I to just, share? I'd I love just to did. see the case. Go ahead. Uh, maybe Luca, maybe we need to stop you sharing and then we're going to allow Dan to show 
some images of escapes. Let's go ahead and learn together. And I'm sorry, I'm going back and forth. I'm actually doing a federal meeting at the same time. So we're trying to multitask, but this is very important for us to learn from you. Go ahead, then. You should be able to, to share now. Let me see here. Uh, I'll try to share the images. And I see Dr. Sapsevis as well, right here, who's our world expert neuropsychologist, creator of the Neuromapper being used in uh, how many countries right now? David, is your technology? Uh, Mexico is next because we just used it in Mexico. <laughs> uh, I think it's more probably up to five or six uh, countries okay. right now. Beautiful. Let's see. And then. I know that Dr. Vargas, Dr. Q, also had uh, his uh, hand raised uh, just oh. a moment. So beautiful. For us to go. Uh, as, as well. Dan is setting up this case, Gabriel, you want to ask? Yes, we can see it. Perfect. Okay, I don't have so many images, but this is the case. This is a 35-year-old uh, male presents with seizures, and this the MRI. This is a flare MRI. I don't have the T2 MRI like Lucas uh, showed before. And my question is, we discussed this case and we were thinking about perform a biopsy or a wake surgery. After discussing with the family and our staffs, we decided to perform a wake surgery. In the beginning of the surgery, everything was negative. So we started, we started uh, in the OR operating from the frontal area. And after we touched the frontal area, uh, with the bipolar, uh, everything starts to be positive and the patient became aphasic. Uh, after, in the final of the surgery, we could remove anything of the tumor, almost anything. We perform only a small biopsy and we perform a small uh, temporal lobectomy because the patient uh, was be uh, becoming aphasic. And the day after, we saw his post-operative CT scan and he did a uh, wounded glioma syndrome, like a big edema. And I would like to know if uh, Lucas experienced, if he experienced this before, like he opened, uh, he tried to make a wake craniotomy to operate the tumor, but he couldn't operate the tumor because everything was positive and how he managed this. I'm going to ask, Luca, why don't you go ahead and come and then I'm going to ask also if you can stop sharing your screen, then that'll be terrific. We get the image. I'm going to ask Lucas to go ahead and answer. And I'm going to ask Dave Sapsovich to go ahead and comment and then JP because we have had experience with these cases multiple times. But Lucas, go ahead, please. Um, uh, first of all, uh, I'd like to thank you, Professor Tignones, for the opportunity to be here. Uh, it's a real pleasure. It, uh, we thank you because you're mm -hmm. the one who is like about how many hours you're like this is like early in the morning for you so we really appreciate you being here no i'm i'm used it to, to wake up early <laughs> <laughs> um about about the the question of oberman uh hello uh, oberman uh it's it's a very interesting case i i it's, it's a really challenge case as a matter of fact we may see it it's the, the it has a portion of gliomatosis here uh, at first of all, seeing it, we it's it's really different from from my case. It's much more challenging because there is already involvement of perforating regions, uh, caudate region, the thalamus, the, the the internal capsule, the putami, all all the, the global pallus. So it's it's very very different here. And probably if if there is a very interesting paper of Professor Depo that he, he tried to, to do a, a, a minimal common brain that lets you, you estimate uh, how, how the, the percentage you can remove. And if you apply the, the, this, this minimal common brain here, probably you, you will not be able to remove at least 80%. If you are not able to remove 80%, Probably the surgery will not change the natural history, and so a biopsy it's it's a uh, first choice here, in, in my 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 opinion. Uh, but uh, 
it's 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 nice you ask it here. Um, as a matter of fact, I have a really similar case uh, here here in my city. It's more much more a, a economically viable to do a open surgery than a stereoplexy biopsy. So I have a really similar case to, to you maybe two months ago, and it, it's not so large as your case. Uh, but but it's it's a left a frontal temporal insular glioma, uh, Yazagil 5B. And uh, the, the neuroplasticity was much inferior than I expected. And I believe that uh, when the, the neuroplasticity is much, much inferior than what I expected is because of the, there's not a real like low grade glioma. It's a high grade glioma and the glioma uh, grow up so quickly, quickly that the neuroplasticity was not possible. So I believe your case is it's a high grade glioma. It's a gliomatose, at least grade three. And uh, it, it may happen in, in high grade lesions. Beautiful, Lucas. I saw Dr. Chaitana with a question right there. So maybe this is the perfect time to ask Dr. Sasevitz because he works very closely with us in the afternoon with JP and myself. And then I'm going to have, we're going to pivot to JP. Uh, Dave, are you there? You still there? I'm here. Yes. Yeah. Go ahead, Dave. Uh, yeah. I, I had to step away just briefly there, Q. Um, what exactly do, uh, can I comment no, on? No, I here? just, no, the issue of, you go in, you open a case like this. Yeah. Uh, you saw the images. I mean, clearly, uh, you know, as Lucas described, potentially a high grade gliomatosis cerebral like, you know, and everything looks good at first. And you're about to start the surgery, and suddenly you cannot touch anything because everything is positive. The patient is completely yeah. symptomatic. And I think that this is the right thing. I think that uh, then you did the right thing. Once you get that, it's like the movie, the hurt locker. If you don't know which wires you're going to disconnect, you're going to disconnect the wrong wire, and that patient is going to be in severe, you know, distress for the rest of their life. So you just got to do a biopsy and get out of there. Yeah. Minimal, yeah. Uh, pull out of that. But go ahead, uh, Dave, your experience with those cases. Yeah, I mean, they're hard, especially, I mean, we've done a few, Dr. Q, where we've just gotten, you know, function everywhere. And, um, you know, if you don't have a corridor, I agree, you have to be real conservative. Um, you know, with, with uh, you know, lower grade gliomas, there's this idea that, um, you know, when left in the brain, it can promote some reorganization and potentially shift functions out of the way, even with a very small surgery. So one strategy with low grade gliomas is, you know, you might feel, okay, I'll take as much as I can be real, real, real conserved. I go back later and maybe there's some shifting of functions with high grade gliomas. Obviously that's not so much the case. Um, yeah, I, I mean, you know, one of the things that we, I don't think the field, um, you know, we don't have a lot of data to speak to this yet. And maybe if we get data on this, this could guide some decision making is, you know, uh, what is the recoverability of different cortical epicenters and subcortical tracts? And specifically along certain subcortical tracts, there may be certain areas that have less plasticity than others. Um, you know, so I think it's going to be important to continue to look at outcome data uh, and see, because that could guide surgical decision making. Maybe even with positive function, there may be certain areas that you might feel still more comfortable taking than uh, than others. The SMA is a classic cortical area where we can get lots of positive function, but we know patients make a good recovery. You know, do we understand that as far as along certain white matter tracts, certain segments of the same white matter tract maybe is more recoverable than others? <clears throat> And Lucas, wonderful presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I mean, just in the topic of, of the the tracks, uh, I'm sorry, Dr. Q, please go ahead. I no, I was going to say, no, I was going to have you just comment because, you know, just maybe this is a, a good time to comment in the circular grid, why we neuromonitor, why we monitor, especially because that goes to Kai's question. Was the patient having seizures, yes or no? You know, was the patient already irritable? And that's those are the things that we, have been able to pick up with things like the circular grid that we invented here. So go ahead. No, no, I, I was just going to mention in the topic of the circular grid, Dr. Q, as you mentioned, like uh, Lucas, I think explained well, the kind of like the different realities as you know well, like, so that's the one thing that he was saying, I would, if I could, that's the one thing that I would have uh, during that surgery. Uh, Lucas can explain it better, of course, but he was saying that he is doing it without the microscope, without neural navigation, but from all of those technologies to use like a, like a circular grid or, you know, electrocorticography would be the one thing that if he could use in every single case, then he would. 
and still, of course, the financial restraints, that's that's not always possible, of course. It is amazing, actually, Lucas. And, and then I think that this is where we have benefited and, and that David has been there. And that's what Kai was asking, because just the case that we were going to present, which we're not going to present today, but we'll save it next time. Gaetano did a beautiful job. You'll see that we are monitoring and Gaetano and, and, and all who are taking the tumor out. And we see as soon as we put the circular grid, we see an area where the patient is doing this. They don't even realize that they're having seizures. Yeah. You know, sometimes you begin to see deficits in their speech and sometimes the deficits are even more pronounced. Then you ask the question, am I stimulating? Yes or no. Is my stimulator yes or no giving the patient a deficit? Or is the patient is already spontaneously seizing that is spreading throughout the brain? I would suspect that something like what you saw right there, especially when you came in at first then and everything was fine and you're ready to take the thing out for what I understand. And suddenly everything is positive. I think that you're probably becoming to have what is called neuronal activity. A lot of people are studying, I'm at a study section right now. It's called clinical neuroimmunology and brain tumors. And it's for the federal government. This is where we decide to give big grants, you know, uh, mil multi-million dollar grants in the United States to study these issues. And it's becoming more evident that there's a concept of oncoepilepsy. We have an opportunity to uh, explain it and understand it in the operating room. We not only need to record, you know, with these devices, which by the way, they should not be that expensive. The problem with ours is that we haven't been able to license it and commercialize it, but we will in the next two to three years to make it available to the world. So that way, in those areas, you go ahead and collect microscopic pieces of tissue and begin to send them to the laboratory and understand what is the role of inflammation, what is the role of neurotransmitters, and what is the role of cell migration and how is the tissue microenvironment changing everything. Because once we understand what can we do to block those events, then probably you limit all this craziness that is going on in the brain and then be able to tailor your craniotomy a your resection a little bit more. I suspect that that case, if you go back again in the future, if you put my experience, and I, we've written about this, you know, even before we came to Mayo, we put them in two anti-seizure medications before we go into the operating room to prevent precisely this. Before that, we had a cohort of patients where we didn't do that, and those patients had less extent of resection, more intraoperative seizures. Every time I get more intraoperative seizures, undoubtedly, I cannot do a good of extent of resection. And I'm talking about intraoperative seizures by, you know, electrocorticography. The, the patients may not necessarily be totally symptomatic unless you do very thorough neuropsychological testing, which is what Dr. Subservice does. So I definitely agree with Lucas, the cortical, uh, cortical corticography and electrocorticography is more crucial to me than even the navigation, the microscope, and all those things, especially for this case, is going to be crucial. But very, very challenging cases, then, and beautiful presentation, Lucas. Sorry that I was going in and out. No, thank, thank you very much, Professor. Thank you very much. The call, it would be great to use it, but unfortunately not available. <laughs> maybe maybe when JP and I, we make a trip over there, you know, we'll bring one of those and we'll, oh, we'll, we'll it would troubleshoot be, it. <laughs> it would be great. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And then Lucas and I have two payers, I mean, they're taking us to some nice places, but <laughs> that's fine. Hey, hey, what uh, are the drinks that you want me to drink? The caipirinhas or something like that? Uh, cachaça. <laughs> first a pure cachaça and then the caipirinhas. But first we start with the strong stuff. <laughs> uh, cachaça. I, the cachaça first. I just would like to go because I know that we have Dr. Yes. Dr. Vargas had a question uh, yes. uh, you know, a few minutes ago. I don't know if that has been answered. Dr. Vargas? Yeah, thank you, thank you very much, and for the for the cases, both cases, uh, uh, Lucas case, very good case, and Dan case, a different situation. Uh, just want to do a, a small comment for the Dan case first. Uh, many times, or not, sometimes, happen. This happened, and as Dr. Quinones said, it's maybe a seizure or something like that. But if you wait not a little bit, a lot, but you have the patient already there, the craniotomy is open. Many times the patient has start to to you know to, to try to, to do something and you can really follow the stimulation and you try to to um, start at least with some removal of the tumor. So in this type of situations wait a long time, not 
short time, long time, long time, more than half an hour. Not desperate. Just wait, wait a little bit, and 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 stay there. Uh, many times you can do the surgery. Uh, that that's my experience. Not too big experience, but uh, but I I can tell you that. Uh, I don't know how do you win, uh, and I imagine that many, many hours and many minutes, I don't know. And Lucas, just one question. You showed Dr. Berger's and I t uh, diagram, and many people are paying attention on sylvian fission and uh, MCI uh, follow the cases and try to pay attention to that anatomy, which is, of is very important, but when you see Dr. Dufos, which I follow also, is just transcortical and go. So uh, just for for the teaching uh, point of view, what is your recommendation uh, of the people that try to follow the MCA approach and those kind of uh, anatomic uh, boundaries of the tumor uh, against that uh, transcortical approach by monitoring? I don't know if you, if you understand my yeah, question. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, for Professor Vargas. Uh, I believe you are asking me about the transcortical, oh, transcortical transcision approach, right? Yes. The, this, this paper of Professor Bergen was very interesting because it, it, it concerned just about this question. Um, to do a, an awake procedure, uh, to me, it's much more easier to, to go uh, transoperfluo. The transceiving approach in an awake fashion, most of the time there is some pain with the manipulation of the sylvian veins. And to me, it's much more risky to, to work with the, the veins. I believe that we, we, we have three options to do this surgery. We may have a transceiving approach. We may have a transoperfluo approach. And when the, the lesion is really, really, really big, we need to go transoperfluo expose the, the sylvian or the insular cortical surface and go trans, uh, uh, tran, trans uh, not so pure transcortical, transcort, trans, uh, remove the uh, opercular part and after go through the cortical, insular cortical uh, surface. Uh, in my opinion, the most safe one and the one that is better to awake because of pain pressure is pure transcortical approach. Um, I had I I I do did uh, I did some cases uh, transfusion uh, and I have pain pain complaint and in my opinion the exposure is not not so good at the the superior part and the inferior part in this case the, I believe that the superior portion would be very limited uh, because there was a really involvement in the zone one and two. I, I I hope I, I answer your question. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Vargas. Uh, and I just wanted to see, because I had I, I know that Dr. Hakeem and Diego are here as well. I wanted to open to them and see if they would like to share some uh, comments as well. And uh, and then we already eight oh five. Then we're gonna finish the session for the day, but. Always pleased to hear from uh, our colleagues from Colombia too. Hey, good morning, JP, Fernando Hakim. Uh, good morning. Just a very short word because it's late now. I think this case uh, teaches a lot. One of the things that teaches a lot for everybody is the way that you have to look at a case before you go into surgery. You have to study the case very well like he did, the like doctor did, the doctor that presented the cases. I think that's the most important thing. You have to have plan A, plan B, plan C. And if you do that, you're gonna have, the results are gonna be very good. And I, I also, also think that the anatomy is anatomy, 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 as you always say, is the most important thing in all these cases. If you have the neural navigation, it could probably help. I think in my experience, it does help, but definitely anatomy is the most important thing. But uh, I think this is a, it's a case that when you see it, you think two times it's going to be a hard case because the insular, insular tumors are hard, definitely. But with a technique, anatomy, knowledge, and all the toys that we have in surgery, the results every time 
are better. So thank you very much for the opportunity of uh, seeing how people all over the world are doing things very well. That makes you, as a neurosurgeon, makes you feel very well. That you're happy that everybody's doing things, uh, everybody likes to grow. So um, that's what I want to say. And thank you very much. Hope to see you soon, JP and Dr. Q. Thank you, Fernando. Thank you so mm -hmm. much. And uh, Lucas, uh, well, it's already 8.05. Uh, and uh, I'd like to apologize uh, to Gaetano and team. I know Gaetano had a presentation ready to go following Lucas, but I think we all got very excited with your very nice case, Lucas. And uh, well, just like to thank you uh, for me, for Kai, for all the others that knew you already. We already expecting a fantastic case. Thanks for delivering. And uh, thanks for joining us today. And uh, well, looking forward to see you all guys again in the next Friday with more cases. And we also have our Monday session. Uh, Diogo, you want to? Perfect. So you see next Monday, we're going to have our grand rounds with Dr. Samit Patel. He is a senior associate consultant uh, in the Department of uh, Otolaryngology here at Mayo, Florida. And he's going to be talking about microvascular reconstruction of the skull base. So a very, very important topic, uh, especially to us focusing on the skull base as well. Uh, everybody is welcome as well. Uh, this is an open session such as today. And next Friday, we're going to have uh, our pituitary session as well, where we're going to have two very challenging cases that we already working on then uh, right now as we speak. So thank you, everybody. Have a very good weekend. And uh, well, so good to see you all. Muito obrigado. Gracias. Muito obrigado. Muito obrigado. Obrigado. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.